So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope, I think there will probably be a few more joining as we go along. But yes. uh, for those who are already here, welcome to this kind of second talk on Isolde physics. Uh, so last week, Gerda gave you an overview of probably fundamental physics, nuclear physics, laser spectroscopy, Coulomb excitation, this kind of stuff, with, uh, which more focuses on the nuclear structure side of things. Uh, this week, I will talk about the uh, three other programs, which are fairly strong and are running consistently at Isolde, the solid state, biophysics and medical programs. Um, I will not give equal weight to all of these. I'll kind of give most of the balance or uh, attention to the solid state program. Uh, and then just indicate that for biophysics, you can also apply some of the techniques that we uh, have developed here and elsewhere uh, to a, a range of biological materials. Uh, and then I'll spend a little bit of time also on the medical program at Isolde, where we try to develop unusual isotopes for future diagnostic therapeutic uh, applications for the treatment of cancer. Uh, this is very important, not just for getting money for nuclear physics research, uh, but also for enhancing the facility in general, widening the, the user community. Uh, and that's also a good motivation for future expansion, which is also on our kind of midterm plan to be able to expand these older uh, to maybe a new experimental hall within the next 10 to 15 years to accommodate the, the growing uh, community. So Isolde, I will briefly outline the facility, the applications and some of these uh, topics. I'll go through some of the reasons why we bother to use radioactive isotopes. Uh, for nuclear physics, of course, you often have to use radioactive isotopes. You can quite happily have a, a long distinguished solid state physics career without bothering yourself with uh, radioactivity, but there are certain advantages to uh, and, uh, combining the two fields. Uh, not always, but uh, you can get very unique experiments by combining uh, nuclear solid state physics. Uh, I'll give you a few examples of the techniques and a few physics results from nuclear solid state physics in the last few years. And then, as I say, I'll also go through the, the nuclear isotopes from medicine, uh, where Isolde can play a role in uh, looking for new isotopes for the future, which may become more standard as we understand how to produce these things in a hospital situation. So a quick uh, sketch of uh, where I'm coming from. So I was originally uh, from Ireland, so quite close to the border uh, in the Republic, but quite close to Northern Ireland. Um, yeah, born very close, just down the road from uh, our UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site, New Grange, a burial chamber, which is uh, about 500 years older than the, the pyramids, and uh, well worth a visit if you're ever uh, in the area. Uh, after that, I had my first degree in Dublin in applied physics in Dublin City University in 1996. Uh, and then I followed this with a, a PhD in King's College London. A PhD was taken in 2000 and a postdoc finishing in 2002. Uh, working on the properties of metal nitrogen complexes in synthetic diamond. Uh, and you will notice as part of all of this, I never did any nuclear physics or dealt in any way with radioactivity. So I basically had a quite a, a reasonable uh, innings just uh, doing classical solid state physics. And it was only later on that I began to get interested uh, in applying uh, radioactive methods to, you might say, classical semiconductor spectroscopy. So my first experiments at Isolde were done in conjunction with uh, the University of Saarbrücken in Germany. Uh, and I helped to build a, a photoluminescence laboratory at Isolde, uh, which was on site so that we could use short-lived isotopes to look at optical transitions in zinc oxide, which uh, in 2003, 2005 was a very, very hot material for semiconductors research. Uh, and we were able to identify numerous uh, optical transitions due to the decay of radioactive isotopes. So this is my first introduction to Isolde. I never imagined that in 2003 I would end up spending more than 15 years uh, at CERN, but uh, that's the way these things go. Um, in 2005, there was a very brief interlude in Prague, uh, also a beautiful city to visit, uh, where I briefly worked on the photoconductivity properties of nano diamond and materials. Uh, and then at the end of 2005, I was offered the chance to come back to CERN to be the solid state coordinator, basically responsible for the solid state program. Um, and this ran for several years. And now I'm the, the physics coordinator uh, at Isolde, where I basically plan the, uh, uh, the experimental campaigns and assist with various research campaigns as well. 
Um, so this is just a view of Lake Geneva uh, a few weeks ago. We uh, haven't had much uh, action in the labs recently due to COVID, uh, but you can still have some uh, nice walks uh, while you keep socially distant in Geneva. And here you see uh, the lake, a very unsubtle fountain, which is the, the symbol of Geneva. Uh, and uh, again, if you're ever in the vicinity, a very nice place to visit, uh, with very nice hikes uh, uh, all around. Um, you have probably seen this last week at, from Gerda, but i just give you a quick uh, reminder of where we are situated at CERN. Uh, so from next year, uh, at the moment, they are just doing the hardware commissioning, but the new linear accelerator, LINAC-4, will start delivering beams to the booster, uh, which will accelerate beams to 1.4 GeV, uh, and also 2 GeV for the, uh, the higher energy physics uh, from next year. Um, and strategically located right beside this booster is, is all the facility uh, where we basically tap into the uh, spare capacity that the booster has in terms of proton production. Uh, due to the PS limitations, the booster is able to produce far more protons than the PS can accept. So we are here to basically take that um, extra protons uh, and where we direct them out to a, a small target from where we produce radioactive uh, isotopes. And I'm sure Gerda has discussed all of this last week, but just a reminder that Isolde uses about 65%, 60, 65% of all CERN's protons. So it's quite a, um, a, a good customer of the booster. And we are still by far the, the biggest consumer of protons uh, of all the experiments uh, at CERN. And okay, I don't need to do that. And this is the nuclear charge for Isolde. So the unique aspects of Isolde, even though there are now quite a few radioactive ion beam facilities worldwide, is that Isolde still has you know, the greatest range of available isotopes of any Isolde uh, facility. Um, so we have about, uh, that's a little bit out of date, I should have updated this, it's now about uh, 1300 isotopes, 1200 to 1300 isotopes from about 75 elements uh, are available. Uh, and this basically covers most of the periodic table. We have a few annoying omissions, uh, especially in the transition metal area where uh, certain isotopes are just too refractory uh, to come out of it in Isolde target. Isolde target it runs around 2000 degrees Celsius uh, and there are certain elements which only start being liberated around 3000 degrees Celsius. So uh, elements around like such as cobalt and vanadium tend to get trapped inside and you can't get them out. Uh, so we have to try some molecular tricks to be able to, to do this. Uh, and there's also some region up here just below the, uh, uh, the very heavy that we are also not accessible to. But by and large, we have good coverage of the entire uh, periodic chart. And this allows you to plan uh, interesting nuclear physics uh, experiments, but also extremely interesting experiments for uh, what they call applied nuclear physics, uh, such as solid state physics and, and biology. Uh, the big difference being for nuclear physics, we can often live with very low uh, production yields Certain uh, experiments are able to live one ion per second, or maybe up to two or three hundred, and we'd still be quite happy. For material science and medicine, we are typically only interested in yields, which are about 10 million ions per second, because we basically want to get enough ions into a, a sample or a material in a short enough time that we can then do some offline or subsequent spectroscopy uh, to study the effects of what we've just implanted. So. Um, and to do this, we have to get above certain sensitivity levels, uh, which typically means we need to get with 10 to the 11 ions into a sample in a reasonable amount of time. And for this, we are usually talking about 10 million ions per second, maybe 100 million. Uh, and this <clears throat> basically means we are implanting isotopes quite close to stability. So for nuclear physics experiments, it's not very interesting. But some of these uh, isotopes quite close to stability have interesting properties uh, for solid state physics and, and biology that we can harness and which Isolde is very, very uh, capable of producing in, in high quantities. Mm -hmm. So just to give you an idea of where we sit in the overall distribution of uh, yeah, experiments at Isolde. So in 2018, the last year we had physics, we had 51 experiments altogether between April and November. Uh, and you can see that we did about 13 solid state physics experiments, two medical experiments uh, and four bio biological experiments. So. Uh, 19 experiments altogether out of 51 and it accounted for about 22% or so of the overall physics program. So it's quite a uh, important uh, part of the overall science output from Isolde, uh, where even though most of the focus tends to be on the nuclear structure, the, the, the solid state and medical 
and biology is, is quite an important component. And here you can just see this throughout the years where we have uh, almost around 20% of the program has always been devoted to these applications as well. So it's, it's a, uh, ISOL has had this uh, applied program at its heart since the beginning. Uh, other nuclear physics facilities haven't always uh, had this uh, input uh, and they sometimes tack on the, uh, the solid state uh, program uh, to show that they are relevant to society. And ISOL has really been part of the fabric of the facility from the, out, from the outset uh, since about 1972 or so. Uh, and it accounts for a strong part of the overall program. So why do we bother <coughs> um, using uh, radioactive probes for uh, solid state and bio biology? Uh, there are many advantages. One is that it's chemically selective, of course, something like radio radioactivity is a, a, a isotopic methods, means it's chemically selective. You can choose certain isotopes to suit a certain situation. Um, Radioactivity is extremely easy to detect. Uh, so this has many benefits for, uh, if you want to do diffusion experiments to look at certain isotopes are diffused in a material, you can plant a very low level of uh, radioactivity uh, and do some uh, thermal tricks to see how it progresses inside the, uh, uh, inside the material and get a diffusion profile. This is very useful for uh, doping semiconductors, for example. And it's also because it's so easy to detect radioactivity uh, you can get away with 10 to the 11, 10 to the 10 even probes. It means you can really probe the material uh, without uh, damaging it or uh, compromising the uh, host material itself. For certain other techniques, you often have to put so many probe atoms into a, into a material uh, that the, uh, the actual material itself that you're trying to probe becomes distorted because of the amount of, amount of probes that you've in introduced. Here we are able to keep to a very low depth or a very low concentration of, of probe atoms which allows you to really uh, observe uh, transitions and uh, you know, physical uh, properties of the material without you know, uh, influencing the host material itself. And we're also able to look for local magnetic and uh, electric fields. These, are, are these, these uh, nuclear probes that we introduce are very uh, sensitive sensors to the local environment in which they are placed. So basically a nuclear probe can sit inside a lattice and sense the immediate environment in which it is sitting due to something called the electrical field gradient. Uh, and this allows us to really understand uh, chemical bonding, uh, fast uh, chemical processes, and also electric and magnetic uh, interactions at these uh, in, in materials, which is not always uh, very easy to observe using other techniques. So that's why we do it. They are sensitive, they are selective, um, we can choose what we want for this particular case in point, depending on the chemistry. If we want to study one type of effect, we can implant uh, probes which are likely to go on one side of a, a semiconductor or a different probe which will go on another one, according to the chemistry. We can control the uh, energy spread by tuning the energy of the beam so we can go deeper or closer to the surface, as the case may be. Uh, and often these are fairly easy isotopes for radioactive ion beam facilities to produce, uh, which means we can get uh, reasonable amount of atoms into a solid in a, in a short amount of time. Uh, in terms of politics, this is always a good thing, uh, as the uh, <clears throat> uh, often the philosophy of the next generation radioactive ion beam facilities is to go to the more exotic isotopes for nuclear physics, uh, and they're not always interested in trying to serve customers who want relatively easy uh, isotopes, but which can be used for quite a high level science for in a, in a slightly different way. So this is something that we always have to kind of uh, negotiate and make, make our case clear that uh, relatively easy uh, isotopes can still be put to very good use uh, if the science case is there. So applying radioactivity to solid state physics looks a bit like this. We start with our nuclear probes or uh, alpha, beta, gamma emitters. The interactions that we tend to use can be uh, the radioactive decay, just looking at the half-life. Uh, and this is just a uh, technique such as the one I originally started in, photoluminescence, a very common technique for characterizing semiconductors, uh, diffusion, as I mentioned, and also DLTS, which is a, a characterization technique for electrical measurements in semiconductors. I won't talk very much about these, if at all, during the rest of the course of the, the talk, because the, the recent uh, program has been a bit uh, quiet in this area. I will talk about hyperfine interactions and Coulomb interaction techniques, uh, utilizing different effects, such as the Musbar effect, uh, which is a, a well-known effect 
in, in crystals and uh, other materials. Uh, angular correlation can be used also to look at uh, local environments inside uh, materials and can NMR techniques as well. Uh, recently we started at Isolde, has been a beta NMR campaign to look at biological systems and I'll show you some of the recent progress in this. Uh, last week, Gerda probably talked about hyperfine interactions in terms of uh, radium fluoride molecules for beyond standard model uh, physics. Uh, here we use these hyperfine interactions to probe uh, on a very sensitive scale uh, electrical and magnetic interactions inside materials, uh, allowing us to get a really close uh, uh, understanding of what's happening inside materials, which is not always accessible through other means. And then one of the techniques which is almost unique to Isolde is emission channeling, where we implant radioactivity into a material and then watch it being channeled through various high direction uh, symmetry uh, directions. And this allows us to understand where uh, these probes are sitting inside the material, whether it's on a substitutional site, off site, uh, in between two atoms. And this we can do through a combination of experiment and theory. Uh, and it's a very powerful uh, technique which has now been employed to look at materials for quantum information. Uh, and other uh, nice uh, nice topics. So the Isolde table of elements for solid state physics looks a bit like this. So uh, most of these isotopes have been produced at Isolde uh, and the ones in yellow basically have been used for solid state physics and uh, life sciences. We have a certain number of workhorse probes um, which are usually used for hyperfine interaction campaigns. Uh, 111 cadmium, 199 mercury, 117 cadmium, 57 manganese, 73 arsenic. Isotopes like this are available in very high quantities. So we have 10 to the eight ions per second. And usually every year we have one or two weeks dedicated to using these probes to uh, study a wide uh, variety of materials. And then there's various new interest, uh, promising probes, uh, which are currently being uh, understood, uh, especially the 68 copper could be very useful for magnetic interactions in, um, in materials. Uh, will hopefully be uh, further uh, continued next year to maybe establish future campaigns employing these isotopes. But basically we have a, a wide variety of probes to choose from. So with a little bit of uh, thinking and uh, preparation, you can uh, adapt the, the probe that you want for the material or biological system that you want to study uh, and then apply for beam time and use these for uh, experiments for a certain number of days. Uh, okay, I won't dwell on this. This is just the same kind of isotope table, but for uh, hyperfine technique, uh, uh, methods. Um, maybe the one to focus on here mostly is iron, is the uh, standard probe for uh, most bar spectroscopy often fed from the copper or from the cobalt decay. Uh, at Isolde we use manganese uh, to feed the iron uh, 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 most bar transition and I'll talk to this in a few minutes. So this is just a overview of how Isolde looks like from inside the hall. Uh, it's a bit tight for space, uh, so most of our experiments are actually done offline. The only online experiment for biology is that you can see the DeVito beam line here. Uh, it is a dedicated online uh, setup for biological systems. Otherwise, most of our techniques are done offline uh, in, a, in a neighboring building. Also, we're pointing out that Africa is now a strong part of these older. Uh, community since 1995 or so. They've already been very active in solid state physics. Uh, the, the group of Itemba and Krish Barrett Ram uh, from Durban uh, has been uh, active in many, many experiments. Uh, and now also for nuclear spectroscopy to, to grow the, the field or the, the collaborators from South Africa are growing by the year. And there's still a very strong component from uh, in the MOSPAR collaboration from uh, Johannesburg, Durban and Itemba labs. Uh, just to show you how some of our labs look like uh, offline. So building 508 is a is an offline building underneath the control room at Isolde, where we have uh, dedicated uh, chemistry labs for mostly for um, uh, biophysics. So we can do uh, proper chemical preparation during beam times, before beam times, etc. Uh, we have an optical lab for photoluminescent spectroscopy, uh, a small room of ovens where basically you re repair lattice uh, damage introduced by uh, the damage after uh, the beam is implanted in a sample. So you have to recrystallize it after implantation to be, a, to be able to then study uh, a clean environment in which the probe is, is resting. We have some uh, evaporators and other preparation techniques to be able to put electrical contacts uh, and other tin films on, on certain materials. And here you see some of the spectrometers for perturbed angular correlation where you have six detectors 
uh, all around a small uh, region which holds a sample, uh, which is used for a wide variety of materials, such as nanomaterials, multiferroid materials, biological systems, and good old fashioned semiconductors as well. Um, one of the, you might say, challenges in doing uh, solid state physics with a radioactive ion beam facility is staying relevant. Uh, in the good old days, most of the attention was on uh, bulk semiconductors such as germanium, silicon, uh, which was still very active until about 2002. But then most of the uh, interesting problems, with the exception of maybe solar cells and silicon, uh, began to, to fade away. Um, so they, a new generation of materials began to be studied uh, at Isolde. Uh, these range from the topological insulators, which got the Nobel Prize a few years ago, um, looking at uh, these complex uh, interactions uh, in terms of uh, coupled magnetic impurities in, in materials such as uh, bismuth selenide, uh, selenide uh, also graphene, of course, and other two-dimensional materials, looking at the origin of dilute magnetism in nanomaterials, um, are areas where we have proved to be quite successful in, uh, in, in staying relevant. One of the challenges of a place like CERN is that every two years or so, every four years, four, two years, uh, the accelerator chain can shut down, as is the case at the moment. Uh, and this is a bit of a frustration for solid state physics, which moves at a faster pace compared to, say, nuclear physics or particle physics. Uh, a year is a long time in, in these areas, such as topological insulators or quantum information, which is one of our current uh, uh, very active areas. Uh, so we hope that when we get going next year, we'll be able to have successful uh, campaigns because uh, we lost two years of physics due to the upgrade of the accelerator chain at CERN. Um, it's, a, it's a part of life, but it's, a, it's also one of the frustrations of trying to do these programs uh, at a large scale facility. Uh, other materials that we tend to uh, focus on are next generation uh, solar cell materials, such as uh, copper, indium, gallium, selenide, uh, where we are we able to probe the different layers of these materials and especially look at the fusion issues which are relevant for uh, device uh, preparation. Also other uh, solar cell materials are also being investigated uh, and um, wide band gap semi materials such as zinc oxide and uh, gallium nitride and other wide band gap materials are also part of the, the core program. Uh, one of the uh, questions that people have been trying to answer is uh, are magnetic semiconductors feasible at room temperature. We'll come back to this in a, in a case study later on where I show you that at least for some of the cases which were predicted about 20 years ago and which uh, launched an enormous experimental campaign uh, for zinc oxide and gallium nitride were sadly not found to be the case where there was a specific type of magnetism uh, observed at room temperature, but not the one that we were hoping to see and which would be useful for devices. Um, and then also the next generation of semiconductors. So gallium nitride is now in all our LED light bulbs that we are replacing the, uh, the tungsten ones with. Uh, there are still, even though we know the chemistry recipe to make these things fairly efficient and uh, bright these days, some of the physics underlying uh, the doping inside these materials is not fully understood uh, and it could be improved. This would improve the lifetime and the efficiency in the, in the longer term of some of these devices. And there's still a, a strong campaign to understand some of the physics in these materials, which will then feed into future uh, uh, <coughs> device uh, development as well. So the first technique I'll talk about on this Nobel Prize Day uh, is the Mossbauer effect, which was uh, discovered in 1957, and he got the prize four years later. Um, and I guess you've probably covered this whoa, 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 uh, to some degree already. Um, uh, Basically, when a, a, uh, during a nuclear transition, when the gamma ray is, is emitted, there's a certain recoil, which is also uh, emitted for free, uh, which prevents the absorption of this gamma ray in a similar uh, nucleus, uh, in, in, say, a target nucleus of the same, of the same material. Uh, so there's no resonance observable. So uh, back in the 50s, Mossbauer was chasing. There was a lot of interest in trying to get these stimulated resonances uh, in gases or in materials. And he discovered that in iridium, he was able to force this uh, transition to be possible. And this is basically due to the fact that in, in a lattice, uh, the, the mass of the lattice is much larger than the mass of the uh, material emitting the gamma ray. Uh, and uh, the, the amount of phonons uh, in the lattice material have always a probability that no 
uh, phonons will be uh, involved during a transition, meaning that you can get a recoil less uh, emission of the gamma ray, which can then lead to no energy loss during the gamma ray uh, emission, which means that this can then be reabsorbed by a material uh, leading, which gives rise to this resonance that the this fluorescent resonance, which was uh, predicted, uh, and then allows this uh, absorbed gamma ray then to, to be used for studying uh, the material in which it is absorbed. Uh, a, a nice way to think of it is basically if you have a, you know, somebody jumping from a, a boat uh, in a river, if they jump from the boat and the, and the water is, uh, well, water, uh, the, the boat will move away and you won't be able to jump very far. Whereas if you do it in an equivalent uh, uh, at, the, at the North Pole where everything is frozen, the boat will be frozen and you'll be able to jump further, uh, not giving away energy from the process. So this is basically what gives rise to the MOS power effect. Uh, and this is uh, a standard technique which has been used in, uh, I guess, undergraduate labs even to understand some of the fundamentals of nuclear physics. Uh, it's usually done through the 57 cobalt source, which is a very comfortable source, nice 290 odd day half-life. So you can do many 270 day half-life. And this allows you to do uh, a wide range of uh, experiments with one source. Uh, it, it's usually fed like this. Uh, cobalt 57 decays to the iron 57 uh, 502 uh, level. And then subsequent uh, de uh, depopulation leads to the uh, iron 57 uh, resonance gamma ray being emitted at 14.4 keV. Uh, an alternative way to populate this decay is to go via 57 manganese, which is a beta decay into uh, the 57 uh, iron state, which again decays with the 3 over 2 or the 14.4 the keV uh, MOSBAR resonance line, uh, giving off a, rec a recoil to the local uh, environment of about 40 electron volts. And this is the way that we tend to uh, do MOSBAR experiments at, at CERN, where we have a very strong 57 manganese beam with a one and a half, ah, if I do that, it's easier to see. Uh, we have an 85 seconds half-life, uh, and this allows us to uh, basically, instead of very slowly accumulating statistics over the course of three to four, maybe days, or even a few weeks to get one uh, nice MOSBAR spectrum, usually within two to three minutes, we can get equivalent statistics that you would get with maybe a week of 57 cobalt. So this allows us to do a um, very efficient campaign of MOSBAR uh, spectroscopy uh, in four or five days, equivalent to maybe a year or even two years of 57 cobalt measurements. Um, why is it not advancing? Oh, okay. Uh, the information that you get, and maybe this is the slide which is of the, will uh, take most of the information that you will basically take through the rest of the, the case studies that I will show, is basically uh, you get a lot of information via hyperfine interactions uh, on a very local level. So by putting in very low level of probes, so 10 to the minus three atomic percentage, uh, we are able to really probe materials uh, in a very dilute way, not affecting the, the host lattice at all. Uh, we get information about the isomer shift, which is basically looking at the, um, the changes in uh, chemical bonding that the probe is sitting in, in a, in a certain material, be it a semiconductor, a multifluoroid material, uh, a DNA structure, whatever, we're able to see uh, slight deviations from normality of the uh, chemical environment, just due to the, the difference in the electron uh, arrangements that the, uh, the probe is uh, uh, feeling inside the material. We also have a uh, quadrupole splitting due to uh, basically the clustering of the atoms inside the material as well, which basically splits this line from one into maybe two components due to the, uh, the degeneracy of the levels here. And then a very nice aspect of MOSPAR is that it also has this, uh, at least for the iron 57, we have the magnetic hyperfine splitting where we get a characteristic six line spectrum, which allows us to then probe uh, magnetic environments inside the material as well. And this becomes more and more relevant as many of the issues or uh, many important aspects of solid state physics currently uh, revolve around magnetic uh, interactions inside materials. So being able to characterize this in a very sensitive and uh, 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 controllable way is uh, increasing, uh, increasingly of interest. Uh, so this is just an example of how uh, a MOSBAR setup uh, looks like. Uh, this is a quite a simple chamber. It's not very uh, large. It's really, it's tabletop sized. Um, we have a the standard collection chamber for uh, nuclear, uh, for solid state physics is here. And this is a little attach-on, which is about so big, it's really quite small, where a small lid containing uh, 
three or four sample on a ladder are, are housed. These all the beam is implanted into one of these materials, uh, and then the sample is just turned towards a resonance detector here, where the uh, 57 manganese decays into the iron, which then decays through the MOSFET uh, decay, uh, and this is detected here. Uh, and this allows us to basically, as I say, uh, collect a typical MOSFET spectrum in about three minutes compared to maybe three weeks for certain cases. So over the course of many, uh, uh, over the course of a three, four day run, we're able to collect hundreds and hundreds of spectrum, spectra, which can then be analyzed throughout the course of the year. Uh, and in 2016, the 20th anniversary of the uh, very intense 57 manganese beam at Isolde was celebrated. And it's a, a beam which is used annually to, to, to perform MOSFET spectroscopy on a wide range of materials. Uh, I won't dwell on this. This is just some of the isotopes you can look at. Uh, some have been, all have been tried at Isolde. Some are more successful than others. You can come back to this maybe when I upload this, the slides later to the Indico page if you are interested in chasing this a bit more in more detail. Uh, but uh, a nice case study was uh, probing magnetic interactions inside uh, zinc oxide. So a few slides ago, I showed this very famous uh, prediction uh, from Thomas Dietl, which was a science paper from 2000, predicting that room temperature ferromagnetic behavior would be possible with uh, inside uh, wide band gap materials such as gallium nitride and zinc oxide. Uh, and as I say, this launched uh, literally thousands of papers as, uh, about 15 years ago. We were running at around 10 to 12,000 papers a year just on zinc oxide and its uh, properties. Uh, the heat has since subsequently gone out of this, mostly because we've been able to decide that most of the properties which were predicted for it uh, were never realized. And in particular, the uh, the magnetism that was observed, uh, rather than being ferromagnetic, was proven to be slowly relaxing paramagnetic system. So you, at room temperature, you see a very nice characteristic magnetic spectrum. But when you do uh, some angular rotation, uh, um, a magnetic rotation uh, experiments, you're able to see that the uh, actual uh, spectra that you're seeing is not related to a strong ferromagnetic behavior, but rather is this uh, paramagnetic system, which is very slowly relaxing inside the material. So this means that it's not uh, adaptable for devices or for energy or for magnetic uh, uh, semi semiconductors as had been the prediction many years ago. So this, a, a few of these papers from quite a while now ago, 2010, 2012, put some of the final daggers into the um, aims for having uh, paramagnetic behavior in zinc oxide. Um, a more recent paper has been looking at uh, titanium dioxide, uh, also a new material which is, has potential applications for sensing uh, and for some uh, semiconductor techniques. Uh, here, MOSPAR was uh, uh, applied at Isolde to look at various stability uh, regimes related to hydrogenation uh, and was able to distinguish between two very distinct phases, with a quadrupole splitting here and it's more single line uh, beginning to dominate in a, in a certain uh, uh, configuration uh, as uh, thermal treatment went above five or six hundred degrees uh, and it's able to distinguish these uh, two different states in a very uh, convincing way compared to other uh, other types of uh, techniques which are not able to, to see these uh, states in such a clear way. Uh, all of these uh, experiments where you can observe these two different uh, states are now backed up increasingly by quite detailed ab initio density functional theory modeling. And by combining the two situations where you're able to combine different lattice situations and these different configurations uh, of probes inside the material, you're able to relate these back to the hyperfine parameters which are, uh, are measured in, in MOSFET spectroscopy, uh, which allows you to really understand these um, processes inside the material on a very convincing level. And this is a paper from JFIS C this year. Uh, just came out uh, at the beginning of the year, January or February, which is worth, worth having a look at. Um, the next technique I would like to look at is kind of a sister technique to uh, MOSFET spectroscopy. It's called perturbed angular correlation. We measure many of the same kind of uh, aspects as uh, MOSFET spectroscopy, hyperfine interactions inside the material. One thing which uh, perturbed angular correlation is not sensitive to is the, uh, the local chemical environment. Um, it's one thing that MOSFET has an advantage on. One of the advantages, on the other hand, of angular correlation is that it looks at 
Uh, it's a more flexible technique in terms of temperature because you're not limited by uh, factors such as the bivalar interaction inside the material. So you can go much higher in temperature and also much lower in temperature in a more comfortable way to be able to probe electrical uh, and magnetic environments inside a wide range of materials. So this is the most established technique at Isolde. Uh, here you see a few different generations of uh, spectrometers. Uh, here's one from really uh, the late uh, 1970s, beginning of the 1980s. Um, uh, very old style analog, many, many wires and cables, uh, basically feeding all the timing electronics. Uh, here you see a, a very important element here. It's a computer running Windows 95, uh, which is due to the data card, uh, cannot be upgraded beyond that. Uh, here you see a nice DOS program uh, running the spectra, but nonetheless, the spectrometer is still running very well. These old uh, el nuclear electronics keeps going forever. So as long as you have a, a data acquisition computer alive, you, you can keep these things going forever. Um, here you see the more modern variant on this, where you have all of these cables replaced by a few digital um, analyzers, uh, which are able to take all the different signals from timing and uh, delay electronics and just do everything inside electronics. Uh, and then you can do all of the uh, um, processing in software rather than in a, in a more uh, hardware uh, form. Uh, so these are two spectrometers which do exactly the same thing, which you can see here, the, the new generation cuts down significantly on the, the number of cabling needed. Everything is done with digital analyzers. Uh, and then of course the software is much more modern as well. Um, one thing that's unique to uh, Isolde is that we have electron gamma PAC normally angular angular correlation uses a gamma gamma cascade. So for example, uh, 111 cadmium emits a gamma ray through a metastable state with a half-life of 42 minutes. So this is a gamma gamma cascade. And in certain cases, there's also an electron going to a gamma, going to ground state cascade. And that is all that we also have an electron gamma unit to look at this as well. So this gives us a, a wide range of techniques uh, of spectrometers to harness a whole load of uh, unusual isotopes which are only available at Isolde. Uh, this technique has been used relatively widely worldwide but using 111 indium, the, uh, the standard uh, nuclear imaging uh, isotope. Uh, at Isolde we have many more uh, similar isotopes displaying the right gamma cascades uh, and that's why we apply uh, a variety of spectrometers to look at different isotopes to look at a wide range of materials. And so just some recent results to show some of the power of these techniques um, in multiferroic uh, uh, materials, which are getting a lot of attention in the moment. Uh, these are materials which can be used to maybe uh, uh, greatly reduce uh, power consumption in future devices um, because they can be switched in a variety of different ways from magnetic to thermal to uh, electrical uh, properties due to the interaction of uh, polar electrons uh, inside the materials. Um, <clears throat> they display a wide variety of states and ele electronic properties as you go in different uh, uh, temperatures. So the, the material itself will distort at lower temperatures compared to what it is at a higher temperature. Uh, and really trying to understand the various transitions in these materials uh, is, is quite a complex um, uh, process. So here is uh, calcium manganate. Uh, a multiferroic, which may have some uh, interesting thermoelectric uh, properties for devices. But first, we need to understand the different uh, uh, electronic processes inside the material. And here we see a campaign using 111 indium, where the different uh, phases of the material, from tetragonal to orthorhombic to a different type of orthorhombic, uh, are displayed. Here you see the different lattices that the, uh, uh, the, the material can display. And here we see uh, low to high temperature uh, PAC, perturbed, perturbed angular correlation uh, spectra, where we see different uh, frequencies demonstrated as you go along and uh, increasing in temperature. You take the Fourier transform of this and you're able to relate these individual frequencies to where the uh, probe is sitting inside the lattice. So you, you're able to see distinguish between two distinct uh, frequencies here compared to three uh, at higher temperatures. Uh, you combine this then with density functional uh, calculations of where some of these, where the cadmium probe may be sitting inside the, uh, the calcium manganate oxide uh, lattice. Uh, and then you build a picture of what's, what is going on. Also, the other experimental work that you get in the, uh, in, in the material is as you pass certain temperatures, the material begins to distort and you can characterize these phase transitions of the material uh, in a very 
uh, controlled way as you approach a phase transition and you can see where the uh, precise temperature in this case there's a phase transition at around 390 kelvin uh, where the material distorts from uh, basically from orthorhombic uh, with this particular symmetry to a slightly higher symmetry and being able to understand these at such a controlled level uh, is really one of the advantages of using nuclear probes uh, for the study of these materials and this is a program which is now expanding increasingly there's new setups going to arrive in the next few years where we hope to be able to study these materials in situ inside a strong magnetic field to be able to really disentangle the magnetic interactions as well so this is a paper from earlier this year again it's, it's well worth checking out uh, from the group from porto who have been doing a lot of work in this area in the last few years uh, i'll just briefly flash up an example of uh, pac angular correlation uh, using gamma gamma versus electron gamma where you can see two distinct uh, spectra uh, for gamma gamma you see uh, a very specific spectra which is not changing at all as you go from very low temperatures from 12 kelvin up to rim temperature uh, in gallium nitride so the material which is used for uh, led lighting whereas if you look at the same material the same uh, probe so hafnium which is the case with gamma gamma cascade or electron gamma cascade you can see with electron gamma uh, from 12 Kelvin up to 487 Kelvin, you see a completely different distribution of frequencies. Uh, and this is due to the um, changing mobility of the material as you go from low to high temperatures. So this is really an example where you can probe the local environment, but also feel some of the bulk effects of the, um, uh, the bulk properties, electrical properties of the material uh, coming into play. Uh, and this was uh, uh, sil silicon and zinc doped gallium nitride studied using these techniques and uh, gave very uh, interesting results uh, <clears throat> for this material which may have consequences for using these uh, dopants in, in the future. So this was in scientific reports from late last year uh, and it's a unique study. It's very rare that you're able to get the two types of spectroscopy uh, in the same material with the same isotope. So it's a, a nice example of what can be done uh, with these techniques. Uh, here you just see again highlighting the two different frequency distributions. Um, for biophysics, uh, it's, a, it's a case of a similar type of technique, just applied to a different type of um, uh, system. Uh, the research in the last few years in biology has basically been using the same probes that we use for solid state physics for um, uh, material science. So especially 111 cadmium and 199 mercury. Uh, but instead of implanting it into a, uh, a solid matrix, basically into a, into a, a solid crystal, uh, for biology, we usually implant it into an ice drop which uh, you are able to keep at a 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6 vacuum for uh, 40 minutes or so in a fairly comfortable way. Um, once you've stopped your implantation, you remove your ice drop, you take it to the chemistry lab, you melt the ice, uh, and this allows you then to do chemistry with your radioactive uh, uh, solution that you just produced using the radioactive beam in the ice. Uh, and then you can introduce this to a wide variety of uh, biological systems. Uh, and work recently has been on the uh, metalloproteins, which are uh, extremely important, uh, but are some of the uh, dynamics of these proteins are not well understood because in traditional NMR uh, spectroscopy, for example, you only are sensitive to the millisecond uh, time scale. Whereas with these nuclear probes, we are able to see uh, fast exchanges on the kind of uh, tens of nanoseconds and microseconds time frame which is not accessible to other biophysics uh, techniques. So uh, the work at Isolde has been complementing traditional NMR uh, programs uh, at various uh, host institutes, uh, where we try to uh, look at the dynamics in metalloproteins using uh, a, a wide variety of these metalloproteins uh, studied using these probes, which are available at Isolde. Uh, and the type of information you get are similar to what you get in, um, in um, uh, material science, again, probing the, the lattice sites and especially the, the dynamics is something which is not accessible to other biological techniques. So a paper from, again, uh, a few years ago looks at some of the dynamics for a wide variety of metalloproteins uh, where we were able to see the, uh, the proteins on this nano time scale clearly revealed and this was really uh, unaccessible to other, other uh, biological techniques. Uh, the next and I suppose the last method I will really do a bit of time on is the emission channeling method. So this is the one which uses the Coulomb interaction of uh, particles which are implanted in the material. Uh, basically, it's quite a simple technique in principle to explain. You implant 
a certain radioactive isotope inside the material. Uh, and then once it's locked inside the material, as it decays, beta particles, alpha particles, uh, conversion electrons, etc., will be emitted from the probe that you've just implanted. Uh, and depend depending on the electrical fields that they experience inside the crystal, they will either be channeled along certain high symmetry directions, or they will get a bit lost and go off in a variety of, of, of directions. So uh, in certain cases, you get a strong channeling effect as the emitted beta particles are taken throughout the crystal lattice. And in other cases, for the same, for a different lattice direction, nothing is observed because the particles are not channeled along certain directions. So this is a, uh, a technique which when you do this for a combination of high symmetry directions it allows you to build up a, an image of where this uh, probe is sitting inside uh, a certain material uh, and when you combine then this with some theoretical calculations you're able to build up a very very uh, uh, good image of, of where it's sitting and to a precision of less than uh, an angstrom. So these are using detectors which are actually developed at CERN uh, for Time picks and medi picks, you may have heard of these for other, uh, in other talks. Uh, they were originally developed for uh, medical applications, for x rays and other medical uh, PET scans, uh, PET scanning uh, applications. They have a niche application for us that we have used the same kind of two dimensional detectors for recording our spectra of, of the channeled particles as they come throughout the crystal. Uh, and this is just a little kind of a cartoon of what you're expected to see in certain directions as you. Uh, implant and then observe the emission, you will see a high yield along certain directions, whereas in other directions you might see nothing at all because it's just blocked and you don't really see it come out. So if it's sitting here, uh, it get, it, the, the channel particles don't feel the electrical field to be able to get part to get channeled. So they might go this way, they might go that way. But at your detector, you will see basically uh, a much lower signal. Um, this is what the uh, yeah, setups look like in reality. Here you see the two-dimensional detector. Uh, which is uh, placed uh, in, in the in the chamber. <clears throat> uh, the sample is located in the middle of a, a collection chamber. Here we have the Isolde beam going through a variety of uh, collimators. Uh, to be able to get good resolution for these detectors, you have to finely tune the beam to a very high level. So uh, these are probably the most focused beams that we produce at Isolde for these uh, experiments, where we typically try to go to half a millimeter to maybe one millimeter maximum. Uh, of diameter, so this is quite a, a strongly focused uh, radioactive beam. And then the sample is turned, and then the position sensitive detector reads the, uh, uh, the, the channeled signal uh, according to the, the, how, the, how the sample is oriented. And I think here you will see this thing on top is a goniometer where you can basically orient the sample along the various crystal directions to a high precision. Uh, here you see inside the, the chamber itself. Uh, and this setup is normally located here at the uh, what we call the GHM beamline at Isolde, uh, where it's uh, running for uh, doing these experiments with a variety of isotopes, but in general with short-lived isotopes uh, of isotopes of less than maybe one hour half-life. So it's, it's an online system. So you can, you can do thermal treatments uh, and other uh, manipulations all in situ in, in this online uh, chamber. So this is one of the few cases where we have an online uh, <clears throat> experiments rather than uh, being done offline. Uh, some recent results using this technique. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, at PRL, looking at magnesium in gallium nitride. As I say, gallium nitride, we still have to understand some of the physics uh, of what's going on for the doping. We, I say we know the chemistry to make these devices work, but we don't always know some of the physics of what's really going on. Uh, and this was the first indication using this technique of locating uh, interstitial magnesium in gallium nitride. Uh, we also got direct evidence for the amphoteric. So this is the case that magnesium can, um, can uh, act as a donor or an acceptor, depending on where it is. Uh, it can, in certain lattice positions, you find it can be maybe a donor or an acceptor. And this is, of course, quite important if you're using this technique to dope these things p-type, which is the, the normal case. Uh, we found evidence of an interstitial to substitutional a site change according to different uh, annealing temperatures, and it was also uh, able to act, uh, determine the activation energy for the migration of these interstitial magnesiums in this range, so 1.3 to 2 eb. So these uh, results here you see the example of the emission channeling patterns uh, along the different directions, 
and here you see some of the activation energies as well. So this is a PRL, which, which helps to understand really some of the physics of what's happening with magnesium in gallium nitride. More recent work has focused on nitrogen, vent nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond, uh, which is, a, again, a hot topic for the last 10 years or so. And uh, nitrogen vacancy centers are well known in diamond for the last 50 odd years. But in the last 10, 15 years, they've been used uh, increasingly to look as potential candidates for quantum bits uh, and other kind of uh, quantum uh, information uh, applications. It has a very nice coherence time, which is useful for uh, some applications, but a relatively low efficiency for photo to photonic applications. Uh, but nonetheless, it is already been used for metrology and sensor applications, as you can see here, employing nitrogen vacancy to very uh, sensitively uh, probe uh, different magnetic systems. Uh, but for um, quantum emitters, it's probably not the best candidate due to its inefficient uh, photonic uh, response. So alternative to nitrogen vacancy in diamond has been other uh, group four uh, candidates such as silicon vacancy, geranium vacancy, tin vacancy and lead vacancy. And recent work at Isolde has focused on the tin vacancy uh, where this has been uh, presumed to either go uh, or to go un unlike the nitrogen vacancy which sits on this uh, substitutional position in the atomic lattice. Uh, this tin vacancy, because it's much larger and diamond is quite a tight environment to look, sit inside, uh, goes to the split vacancy situation between two different vacancies and then a, a tin in the middle of this. This had never been observed. It was only proposed from theoretical calculations, but work, recent work with Isolde gave direct uh, identification and quantification of this split vacancy in, in diamond for tin based on emission channeling. Here you see experimental patterns combined. Uh, compared to some theoretical fits. So this was as implanted, where we already see it in this configuration. And then after annealing at 920 degrees, uh, you see that the patterns begin to look a little stronger. So there's basically a recrystallization and the tin is really occupying these, the split vacancy position uh, as was presumed. So now knowing this, this allows us to basically give extra information for future uh, devices which may be interested in using this, which use tin implantation as their means of introducing the tin inside the diamond. We also see some optical features which appear to be related to tin, but this has to be confirmed. Uh, but this is in a very recent paper from a few weeks ago, uh, which the uh, uh, mission channeling co uh, collaboration put in, in PRL. Um, a slight tangent, and I'll try to speed up because I think I'm coming to the, to the end of my time at least, uh, is no nuclear physics talk at the moment is, is useful without some kind of mention of the 229 thorium uh, possible nuclear clock. Uh, this is a very hot topic at the moment where we're trying to understand the low level uh, isomer in 229 thorium. Uh, so we know this is around 8 EV, but exactly where 8 EV is has never quite been, uh, or the, the high precision on this level has never been uh, uh, found. Um, the current status is that uh, the energy is quite poorly defined and it's the radiative decay has never been observed yet, uh, due, partly due to internal conversion of uh, electrons and also the radiative decay is, is kind of estimated in a wide range as well. So there's a, a lot of open questions about this uh, low level isomer in thorium. The main interest in that it's at, so, uh, it's at a very low uh, level, so 8 EV is within range of laser excitation. And if this were properly addressable, it could be an extremely accurate and stable uh, atomic clock, uh, not like a, a nuclear clock, unlike an atomic clock, which is still sensitive to um, electronic instabilities and uh, other uh, vibrations, etc. So it could lead to uh, orders of magnitude uh, in, in increase in accuracy uh, for future clock, uh, future nuclear clocks, which would then lead to applications such as much higher uh, resolution for GPS systems and things like this. So this has been a focus of a lot of attention in the nuclear physics uh, material, uh, community. Most of the current work has been through the alpha decay of 233 uranium, which decays into the, the thorium state. But an alternative way, which we are trying to do at Isolde, will be to use 229 actinium beams, which are available since 2018, uh, and to look at the, the beta decay and also the alpha decay uh, of 231 uh, actinium to probe these uh, this isomer in a variety of different ways. One is through uh, nuclear spectroscopy, where we try to observe the radiative emission, but we also are going to use a bit of solid state know-how uh, using emission channeling to be able to 
and plant it into a material such as a wide band gap material, such as calcium uh, fluoride. So this is a very wide band gap material, much wider than even the diamond. Uh, and this blocks the internal transition, which allows us to then see the direct uh, decay of the isomer in a cleaner way. Uh, but to do this, we also have to understand the recipe for moving this uh, uh, isotope or this uh, uh, actinium onto a substitutional position to be able to observe this properly using the nuclear spectroscopy. So the, the, the plan will be to do emission channeling to characterize the uh, location of the actinium inside of this calcium fluoride lattice, uh, and then to tune the uh, recipe for it, to get this onto a, a substitutional site with very little other uh, sites available, and then transfer the, set the sample to a nuclear setup where we try to observe this uh, very low level radiative decay to be able to get a precise measure on this, which could then lead into a, a full understanding of the uh, of, of, of this system. So preliminary data uh, shows 90% of this on substitutional sites, and we hope next year to complete the story when we have a more determined or long living campaign as well. I will just skip over this. This is just to show you that uh, for biophysics, there are also new techniques becoming uh, uh, available online soon. And this is a reactivation of nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, so beta NMR for biophysics. So this will be a polarized beam in dissolver, in this case, uh, sodium, which is implanted into a biological system in a vacuum, in, in a liquid, so basically introducing into a liquid, which is held in a vacuum. Uh, maybe last week, uh, Gerda might have mentioned the Puma project, which is a, uh, a device which will come to Isolde with stored antiprotons and has a vacuum level of 10 to the minus 17. Here we go to the opposite extreme. Uh, this will be, this is when which is coupled to the Isolde beam line, but basically it's at atmospheric pressure right at the, at the point of impact at the drop. And this is just due to a differential pumping system. But we are now, after some tests, able to be sure that we can do this. Uh, so now we are able to introduce radioactivity into a into a biological system in the in the wet state, and then the game or the goal in the future will be to understand uh, DNA DG quadruplexes, which are new uh, discovered uh, uh, DNA structures which have uh, relevance for the formation of many different uh, diseases and also for cancer. Uh, and the folding of this should be accessible with this beta NMR technique, which should again run next year once physics available. And that's just an overview of the, the beam line. And it's an online setup where we have uh, the beam going through a different beam polarized, going through a charge exchange cell into the detection system. Uh, and in addition, next year will be a superconducting magnet, which should allow them to be able to resolve some of the hyperfine parameters uh, of these uh, biological systems. Future plans uh, are in the queue, uh, such as a, a full surface science, which will be coupled to the beam line, a surface science setup which will allow us to do mod, uh, studies of two-dimensional materials uh, in high vacuum situations to be able to understand electronic and magnetic processes in two-dimensional materials. Uh, new setups for uh, magnetic interactions in multiferroic materials using 68 copper beams. And then this is this uh, multiferroic uh, uh, materials spectrometer, which will be able to do perturbed angular correlation measurements inside uh, an eight Tesla magnetic field. So you'll be able to really look at some of the magnetic properties in a unique way. Uh, but we're beginning to run out of space for all the proposed setups. So now we are trying to campaign for a new experimental hall, which might be available in the next 10 years or so. Um, I'll then just quickly go through some of the isotopes for medicine. Uh, so novel isotopes for medicine. This is like gear change compared to the other stuff I've been talking about. Uh, Isolde is able to produce almost any isotope uh, in the periodic chart. So we have a long campaign of running asking doctors for isotopes that they would like in, in a kind of a, a carte blanche dream environment, not limited to the capabilities of hospital uh, cyclotrons. And here are some of the isotopes that are currently being uh, touted as being very interesting candidates. Lutetium-177 is already on the market, so we don't have to dwell on this. Uh, but the other isotopes in this chart are being studied for their feasibility and biological effectiveness, etc. And I'll talk mostly about this quartet of terbium isotopes. Uh, which are getting a lot of interest, mainly because you can do uh, the same chemistry for introducing these isotopes to a biological system, such as a, a tumor, uh, but they all have different nuclear properties, so you're able to do different treatments or diagnostics with each isotope. So this gives you a, a great flexibility in what you can do, all using the same isotope. So 155 terbium uh, is a gamma emitter, which is used for SPECT uh, diagnostic work. Uh, PET uh, scans can be done with the beta minus emission of 152 terbium, which is a 17 and a half hour half-life. 
Terbium 161 is also being used for OJ electron therapy. Uh, and this has even gone into clinical trials now outside Zurich uh, with the Terbium 161 produced by Grenoble uh, at the uh, ILL's uh, neutron reactor. And the, the one which is unique to Isolde for the moment, we can produce all of these, but uh, the one which is most unique to Isolde is 149 Terbium, which is an alpha emitter of four hour half-life, which can be used then to uh, uh, basically alpha treat uh, a tumor at a very short distance without uh, subsequent damage to neighboring tissues. So this is very interesting if it works for alpha therapy uh, programs in the future. So just to show you a little bit of how we do these things, uh, first producing these isotopes is not always straightforward. Uh, and these rare earth isotopes such as terbium, dysprosium, etc., uh, tend to have a lot of oxides just due to the uh, impurities inside these all the target. And this leads to a cocktail of beams, which you then have to control. Uh, so production of these isotopes was hampered for a few years until we understood what was really going on in terms of the uh, uh, production behind the, uh, uh, these isotopes. Uh, but thanks to the MRTOF uh, spectro spectrometer, which Gerda may have mentioned last week, this is a multi-reflection time of flight spectrometer, which allows you to see uh, by reflecting it back and forth between two mirrors, uh, the components inside a uh, is all the beam. We are able to identify the different oxides and different contaminants inside these beams. Um, and knowing what was inside it, we were able to reduce some of these contaminants to, be, to start producing these isotopes more reliably for, uh, for medicine. Uh, once that was understood, uh, a, a suitable foil that had to be implanted into <clears throat> was chosen, which is basically very simple. It's just a gold backing, which is nicely non-reactive in terms of biology uh, and some uh, uh, zinc foils on top so the isotopes are just implanted into this and then this zinc can then just be dissolved away using some acid uh, by the uh, radiochemists which would then use it for introducing it into the systems for for medicine here you see a slightly cleaner version of how we do this now with an ecr source but it's basically the same technology under underlying it uh, and then using these foils we produced terbium which was shipped to psi on the other side of switzerland and we were able to uh, get very high activities over the course of several uh, experimental campaigns. Uh, here you see some of these uh, applications that uh, isotopes have been uh, applied to. Uh, so therapy from 149, uh, 149 terbium uh, and the OJ uh, therapy from 161. Uh, at the moment, this is all confined to animal studies. So here you see a poor unfortunate mouse uh, who has these tumors introduced. Uh, these, so these mice basically have no immune system so the tumors are introduced on the shoulders just to, it's a, the, the, the place where they can be easily uh, studied by the, the scientists uh, and here you see the tumors at a quite an alarming level but following the alpha therapy they are basically almost fully reduced and you say the same uh, behavior here with the the 161 terbium as well uh, for pet then we can also use it for diagnostic for following these tumors inside the body uh, and also how it's taken up by the tumors and also how it's distributed through the body as well and, and if it's retained by the kidneys as well. Uh, and as part of this, you can also do some diagnostics with these isotopes as well. So in addition to the alpha therapy, there's a very weak uh, positron branch from 149 terbium. And here you see an in situ of the, uh, of the uh, diagnostic while the alpha therapy is undergoing uh, due, due to the, uh, the PET uh, scan as well. Um, okay, uh, and I will just very quickly talk about I mean, the main problem for this has been that CERN is located here in Geneva. Uh, outside Zurich, we have PSI where we actually do our experiments. So you lose half your activity just driving the uh, uh, activity there. You know, and then subsequently, sometimes we have to go to Lausanne. So samples used to, have, used to have to go to PSI for cleaning and then back to Lausanne. So we were starting with 700 megabecquerel of uh, 152 terbium and then only getting 140 megabecquerel uh, in the lab in, in the hospital in, in, in Lausanne. So this is a very inefficient way of operating. So we have now uh, gone on to do a whole new facility just for medical isotopes at Isolde, where we basically use a second target at uh, one of our target stations. Uh, the 1.4 GeV protons, 90% of these protons go straight to our target and used to irradiate a beam dump, as you can see here. Now they irradiate uh, a second uh, Isolde target for free which is then transported to an offline separator uh, along the various uh, radiates, kind of like a little train system. 
Uh, and these isotopes are then produced at an offline separator uh, and collected over the course of a few days or a few hours. Uh, and the idea is that using this system, we can do physics for free, or uh, physics for uh, as usual, and you get your medical isotopes for free, so to speak, uh, which will then allow these isotopes to be available six months of the year instead of six days of the year, as has been the case uh, until recently. So this is uh, the medicines facility, which is a new facility for medical isotopes, uh, and will transfer the knowledge of Isolde into a more systematic way of looking at these isotopes for uh, detailed clinical trials to see if they really can be of use uh, for, the, for the future. So that's uh, just some coverage that was in the Serum Courier a couple of years ago at the launch of this facility, but it'll only be next year when we get full protons back, we'll be able to talk about um, uh, medical isotopes uh, from medicines uh, in a more general way. So I'll just finally summarize, I hope I've been reasonably clear along the way, that nuclear physics can allow for very unique experiments to unambiguously study at a very local level, magnetic and structural properties of materials. Uh, and we've had this program available uh, since the early 70s that is all the, due to our large number of beams but also philosophically uh, these scientific areas have also been part of these older programs since the beginning and they've also now been extended towards biological systems and new techniques are, are coming online all the time uh, also core to our program has been the isotopes for medical work uh, but the main problem at the moment is that the pressure for mean time intense is intense uh, and the current generation of radioactive ion beam facilities are beginning to emphasize this and they are beginning to allocate more resources for this in the future uh, and as part of this we are trying to realize a new experimental hall there's a new uh, project at CERN called EPIC we are trying to look at the feasibility of getting a, a new experimental hall for Isolde which I think would ultimately realize this field's ultimate potential uh, where instead of maybe having four or five days of experiments a year you might be able to have six weeks which will allow you to really do more systematic studies as well. If you want more information on some of these topics, you can have a look at this paper here, uh, which summarizes most of the soil state program uh, at Isolde in the last few years. And there, as part of the same issue, you will also find information about the biological and medical work as well. Uh, and I will just stop here and then just acknowledge the various people for who I've stolen uh, material from for this talk. And then if there's time for one or two questions, but I will really have to go maybe in the next five minutes or so. Uh, Carl, thanks very much for this uh, comprehensive overview. It's uh, really good. I think it's important for us to understand that uh, at CERN, it's not just particle physics research that is done. I, I, I just I missed my, my speaker turned off, so I, ah, I missed okay. it. No, I was just thanking you for this comprehensive overview. And um, it's uh, good for us to understand that at CERN, it's not just uh, particle physics experiment with the LHC, LHC and all of the Higgs boson stuff that we have discussed uh, in the past, but there are all other very interesting and, and very good uh, uh, direct applicable research that is being done uh, in many areas, including in, in, in nuclear physics with direct application to material, to, to, uh, 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 to medicine and to even understanding in a more fundamental way the nuclear structure. So uh, I think um, everybody should keep that in mind that uh, there is that multi-dimension uh, research uh, at CERN. Um, so yeah, anybody has any question? Uh, the people connected uh, who are thinking about going in this domain or who are already majoring in this area, you have uh, anyone has any question for Carl, before he has to go. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, you know, he needs to go and pick up his uh, son. So, <laughs> before they close the school. So. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so if anybody has any question, uh, please don't think about it too much. You just let it out. Yeah. Otherwise, you can always feel free to contact me by email or whatever. I, I'm happy to. So, uh, Carl, so... Yeah. Just one question for you. So, what about with respect to the um, University of Geneva, the Geneva Medical Center? Some of these uh, isotopes that 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 you prepare for the me uh, medical application, do they go directly over there for uh, because the issue of half life, they cannot be transported over long distance? Uh, yeah, that's so. that's our main problem at the moment. Most of the interesting isotopes have this short half life, so you are limited by geography. So. Uh, it's basically two hours mm -hmm. around Geneva, or maybe okay. three hours maximum. 
Okay. Yeah, so yeah, in the in the future, the idea is to maybe then transfer this knowledge to isotope pr producers around the world. So we have a link with Aranax in France, mm -hmm. uh, but also I think Etemba are interested in some of this uh, activity as well, so that we could have these isotopes then distributed across the world, so that uh, geography is less of an issue. But first, we are trying to see if they are interesting in, in clinical studies uh, before they would go to more mass production. Now, are you sure they study with the animals? Uh, are there any animal uh, advocacy group who, are, who challenge some of these studies in terms of the treatment or how do you deal with uh, all well, of Well, this? this is, yeah, so this is something we, we decouple ourselves from this to some degree. So CERN flat out says we are not, this is not our, our business. So we do not uh, engage in any animal you know, studies. So then if there's a kind of a link with the partners who have the, who follow the, the ethical rules in the various countries and have to get approval before they can do these studies. So PSI, yes, have a strong record in this, follow the Swiss uh, legislation. Uh, oh. But it's it's something which is, is not always the most comfortable either. It's uh, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. Uh, these, these isotopes are not, to, to put them into, into humans yet is not yet a, a viable option. Uh, so we have we are we are forced to do some animal studies to see the efficacy at least mm -hmm. uh, for for future use. Yeah. So in terms of the beam line structure, I think uh, Isolde sits uh, at the SPS. Is that, is that correct? Uh, no, it's, a, it's at the booster. It's at the booster. Okay. Yeah. So I are you when LHC is not running, Isolde can run. Is that how does uh, is that a correlation? Oh yes, uh, we we basically can run more or less invisibly or the LHC is invisible to us. Uh, okay. So we, we can continue to take our maximum number of protons uh, while LHC is filling. Occasionally we will, we will lose a couple of pulses, mm -hmm. but uh, that's, that's about the limit. So, and I, and LHC has a relatively little effect on us because they, as they, once they fill, then okay. they, they do collisions for several hours. So it doesn't affect us. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's more the PS, if the PS has a problem or if they have some issue or accesses, this mm -hmm. can affect us much, much more than the LHC. Okay. Um, other questions, uh, other comments? Um, so his son is already waiting. So if people don't have questions or comments, uh, I would like to let him uh, go. Hopefully we'll see you again, either in one of our online uh, lectures or in person. Yeah, of physics. Okay, and I, I will send you the lectures. You can upload them. That's right. Uh, Please do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, Carl. If, if anybody much. has a question, feel free to email me. I think exactly. my details should be somewhere, so you can just. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. His email is on the agenda on the Indigo agenda page, so you can. Okay. Perfect. Because uh, especially if anybody's interested in maybe doing, if you're a material science and you're interested in maybe joining some of the South African colleagues who come and do our experiments here, we're always looking for new newcomers and uh, people to do the night shift. It's very important. <laughs> okay. All right, Kyle. Carl, thank you very much. And we'll be in touch. Okay. okay thanks Bye everybody on. for connecting. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.